Hi, this is Pastor Rick Warren. On behalf of my family and all of our staff here at Daily Hope, we wish you and your family a very happy Thanksgiving. This is Pastor Rick's Daily Hope, the audio broadcast ministry of Pastor Rick Warren. Today we continue in our series called Building a Better Future. In these lessons, Pastor Rick shares how we can build a foundation for a better future by following the examples of leaders in the Bible who followed God's calling to rebuild after a time of captivity. Well, you've probably noticed the more grateful a person is, the happier they are. That's the power of gratitude. But it's not always easy to feel grateful. That's why Pastor Rick developed a great new resource called The Power of Gratitude. Go to PastorRick.com to find out more or just text the word DAILY to 800-600-5004. Now, here's Pastor Rick Warren with part two of a message called How to Handle Insults and Ridicule. Here's a second way that people try to stop you from doing the right thing or saying the right thing or attempting something great for God. Number two, people will accuse you of evil motives. And that's the next thing we see in Nehemiah's story. People will accuse you of having the wrong motives, bad motivation, evil motives. Nehemiah 2.19 tells us that those opposed to rebuilding the wall said this, what are you doing? Are you rebelling against the king? What are they doing here? They're questioning the motives of the people who are rebuilding the wall. And they're doing it for shock value. They want to make the builders afraid. You see, they're accusing the builders of revolting against the King Cyrus of Persia. That would be a capital offense worthy of death penalty. So even suggesting that it might be true would put God's people on the defensive. This happens all the time in society today. The truth is, Nehemiah had already gotten the king's permission to rebuild the wall. And the king himself was providing all the lumber needed. So it was a false accusation. But they're just challenging. Are you doing this because you're a bunch of rebels? You're trying to revolt against the king of Persia? Now, in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 2, the critics accuse them of a different motivation because the first one didn't work. And now they accuse them of a different motive. They said, you're not doing this for God's glory. You're doing this, you're building this wall for your own glory. And they ask there, notice on your outline, are you going to restore it for yourselves? Are they going to restore it for themselves? The, the critics of the wall builders are implying that this entire project was for selfish purposes. They say, you know what? We know why you guys are rebuilding this wall around you. This is an ego trip. You're doing it for self-centered glory. You want to be famous. You want to be successful. You want to be known as the people who rebuilt the wall. And, and so what the second thing people do when they ridicule you is they question your motivation. And the truth is this. Nobody ever really knows anybody's motivation. I don't know your motivation. You don't know my motivation. We all have mixed motivations. You don't know your husband's or your wife's motivation, and you don't even know what motivates you most of the time. We all have mixed motivations. So if you can't figure out your own motivation, how in the world could you be expect an expert on anybody else's motivation? When you say, I know why you did that, that's dumb because you don't. You don't know anybody's motivation. The Bible even says that. Now, there's a third tactic that critics and enemies are going to use to keep you from doing what God wants you to do. Okay? They'll question your motives. They'll, they'll challenge and, and ridicule your, your character and your identity. Third thing, people will exploit prejudices against you. When people want to take advantage of you, they will exploit prejudices against you, particularly when they're fearful. Now, we've already seen the derogatory, anti-Semitic, anti-Jew, and racist statements that they did in labeling the builders a pathetic bunch of feeble Jews. In the story of Nehemiah, the enemies use all kinds of religious and racial slurs. Why? Because none of them were Jews. No, they hated the Jews. Everybody who hated the wall hated the Jewish people. Now, the oldest way to rally a crowd 
is to feed their fears. Politicians today have figured that out. The oldest way to rally a crowd is to feed their fears. In Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 19, it says this, When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite and Geshem the Arab, these are three different ethnic backgrounds, they're all non-Jews, heard of our plan, they made fun of us and they laughed at us. Do you realize that the Palestinian conflict is not new? It goes back 2,500 years. These were Palestinians making fun of the people of God, the Israelis, the children of Israel, 2,500 years ago. When the Jews were allowed to return to their homeland after they had spent 70 years in exile and captivity in Babylon, the people who had moved into their land while the Jews were gone in captivity in Babylon, they didn't want to let these immigrants back into their own country. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 7 and 8 says this. There on your outline. When Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites, now there weren't the stalactites or the, you know, uh, out of sights or the, you know, stalagmites, you know, whatever. Uh, but these other ites, they were all there. When they heard the repairs had started, they were very angry. And notice, they all plotted together. Okay, all these different groups plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem, the capital city, and to stir up trouble against it. Now, notice here what's going on. It's no longer just a couple of critics of building the wall, you know, a guy named Sanballat and Tobiah. Now it's a conspiracy. Have you ever seen this happen? In, in, in verse 4, different groups, four different racial groups are mentioned, and they all hated the Jews, and they didn't want them immigrating back. Now the opposition is getting organized. Let me explain this to you. Sanballat was a Samaritan. Those people lived north of Jerusalem. The Arabs represented the people who lived south of Jerusalem. Tobiah and the Ammonites represented the people who lived east of Jerusalem. And the Ashdodites represented the people who lived west of Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is literally surrounded by hostile neighbors. Same thing today. Similar today. By the way, just let me add this in. Have you noticed that negative people naturally gravitate together? It's amazing how negative people can sniff each other out in a large crowd and quickly form a small group to complain. Now, notice the purpose of these, all these groups joining together. Verse 8 said, to stir up trouble. It's always easier to form a group against something than to form a group for something. So that's, a, that's another tactic that's happening in people trying to ridicule and insult and keep you from doing what God has called you to do. Number four, people will make up lies and stories. They'll make up lies and stories about you if they don't like you. They don't like you, the fact that you're a Christian uh, at work or at school or uh, if you hold a different uh, ethical view of different things in society. You believe in the truth, and they don't believe there's such a thing as truth. You know, I could probably fill several books with stories that have been made up about me <laughs> over the past 41 and a half years, and you'd probably get a big laugh out of it. It'd probably be a big bestseller. I, I know you've heard me say many, many times, I, I try to live my life in such a way that people have to make up stuff about me to accuse me. Well, that's never stopped them. Uh, you wouldn't believe some of the goofy things people have written about me. One guy, I remember, wrote a biography on me without ever talking to me or any family member or any staff member or any member of our church. Here's the point I want to make. Every leader eventually has to stop worrying about all the lies that are told about you. Otherwise, you never get anything done. King David said it like this in Psalm 38, verses 12 and 20. Those who want to hurt me plan trouble for me. All day long they think up lies. They repay me with evil for the good I've done, and they lie about me because I try to do good. You can probably relate to that in some way. Now in Nehemiah's case, the opposition to the wall made up the ridiculous assertion that the builders, this is what they were asserting, the builders intend to complete the entire wall around Jerusalem in one day and still have time at the end of the day to go worship for a service. 
Now, nobody had made this claim. They just made it up. But the critics say this in Nehemiah 4.2, do they think that they'll finish the wall in a day and then offer sacrifices to their God, you know, have extra time left over to have a worship service? Okay, they're, they're making up stuff. They're making up lies and stories. That's gonna happen to you. A fifth tactic that opponents still use today is this one. People will predict your failure. If you set a goal, if you announce a, a, a vision, if you begin a business, if you have a project, if you start a new ministry, all of the armchair quarterbacks who never actually built anything great or even attempted it, they'll be quick to predict your demise and your defeat and your downfall and your disgrace and they're gonna forecast uh, that it, it, because it's likely, it's not, li not because it's likely, but because they want that to be true. They're gonna forecast your failure. They, they want it to be true. So they'll say, predict you're gonna fail. They think the only way you can succeed is with a miracle. In verse two, Sanballat said, do they think they can bring burned up stones back to life? from those heaps of rubble and rubbish. What's this guy doing? He's thinking, there's no way these guys are gonna succeed in rebuilding the wall. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever had anybody tell you, there's no way you can do what you think you ought to do. But I've had it said to me many times. I remember an early one in life when I called a well-known influential leader when I was 25 years old, and I was telling him that Kay and I we're gonna to move to Southern California to start a new church with no members and no money and no building. And I had never been a lead pastor. And over the phone, he said, Rick, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> California is a graveyard for churches. I was discouraged by that. Okay, I was told in advance I was gonna fail. I was discouraged by that, but you know what? It wasn't true, but negativity is contagious. And if you hang out with naysayers, pretty soon you're gonna join in with them. Verse three in Nehemiah four, it says, then Tobiah, he'd heard all these other complaints and criticism, Tobiah who was standing by, close by, you know, you get picked, you get influenced by the people you hang out with, joined in. And here's what Tobiah said, right. What they're building is so weak talking about the wall, what they're building is so weak, it'll collapse if just a fox tries to walk on that wall. <laughs> so you can see that these five tactics that people used on Nehemiah, and if they've used them on you, they're not new. This political strategy is 2,500 years old. So here it is. Number one, use ridicule and insults to attack your opponents. Number two, Accuse them of having evil motives so you can de demonize them. Number three, exploit old prejudices and fears against people who are different. Four, have people come to the capital city together to stir up trouble. And five, make up lies and stories to influence people. And six, predict their failure and your win. Does any of that sound vaguely familiar, folks? This is not new. Just read the Bible. Now, having said all that, showing you five ways that people will try to stop you when you're trying to do anything great, the question becomes this, how do I respond to all that? How should I handle criticism? How do I handle ridicule? How do I handle insults? How do I handle when people oppose me and what I think God wants me to do in life? Well, fortunately, that's the rest of the story in Nehemiah. Nehemiah left us a model that we can use today. You can use it this afternoon. So anytime you feel under attack as a Christian, you feel attacked at school, you feel attacked at work, you feel attacked in your neighborhood or anywhere else, you're being opposed. Remember to do these five things that Nehemiah did in Nehemiah chapter four. Write these down, okay? Number one. Tell God how it upsets me. When, I, when somebody criticizes me, it upsets me. When somebody belittles me, it upsets me. You know, little people belittle others. But when somebody 
uh, uh, ridicules me, somebody attacks me. Do you think I like that? No, no one likes that. Well, you, what do you do? You tell it to God. You tell God how it upsets you. You see, it's Nehemiah's habit to always pray first. In fact, in the book of Nehemiah, there are 13 prayers. This is a man of prayer. And every time he faces something hard, you know what he does first? He prays. Do you do that? Do you do that? I want you to notice what he prays. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. It says, so I prayed. And here's Nehemiah's prayer. God, you can hear how they're making fun of us. God, you, you know these guys are ridiculing us. Let their insults just fall back on their own heads. And may them, they themselves become captives in a foreign land. He says, let happen to them what happened to us. We were all hauled off to Babylon for 70 years. May they themselves be held captives in a foreign land. Don't ignore their guilt, God, because they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. Now, you know what I love about this prayer? It's gut level honest. Nehemiah is honest about he feels. He's clearly angry. He's ticked off. He's upset. So what is he doing? He's letting off steam by talking to God about it. Okay? He doesn't tell when he's hurting because he's been rejected or he's been disapproved or he's been put down or he's been abused or whatever. He doesn't tell God what he thinks God wants to hear. He tells God exactly what he's feeling. And he's mad. He's upset. He's ticked off at all these insults. He's irritated by the criticism. Now, here's the point. I want you to write this down. Anytime you're ridiculed, don't take it out on people. Talk it out with God. Anytime you feel under attack, criticized, demeaned, demoralized, prejudiced, when you don't take it out on people, talk it out with God. Prayer is a great stress reliever. That's the first thing Nehemiah did. This is Pastor Rick's Daily Hope. We are so happy you've chosen to study along with us today. Now, if you'd like to receive Rick's free daily devotional, go to PastorRick.com and sign up right now. You'll get hope and encouragement from Pastor Rick delivered to your inbox every day. Rick will be back to close out our time today. But first, did you know experts have discovered that gratitude is the healthiest human emotion? It makes you more resistant to stress and increases your overall happiness and satisfaction. You've probably noticed the more grateful a person is, the happier they are. That's the power of gratitude. In fact, the Bible tells us rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. It's clear that God wants us to develop the attitude of gratitude. That's why Pastor Rick developed a brand new Bible study called The Power of Gratitude. This innovative Bible study is filled with scripture, teaching, exercises, quotes, prayers, and journal pages. And as you go through the study, you'll discover many and often unique things you have to be grateful for every day. You'll develop a lifelong habit of expressing gratitude to God, a habit that leads to true happiness and satisfaction. We'll send you Pastor Rick's Power of Gratitude Bible Study when you give a gift to help Daily Hope take God's Word to people around the world. Go to PastorRick.com right now to get your copy of this great resource. That's PastorRick.com or just text the word DAILY to 800-600-5004. That's the word DAILY to 800-600-5004. And thanks so very much for your support. There's only two days left to get this great resource, so don't wait. Here's Pastor Rick with a special message. You know, there's so much we can be grateful for during Thanksgiving. No matter how things go wrong in your life, there's still something you can thank God for. But let's remember those who are less fortunate. Reach out to somebody with the love of God this Thanksgiving, maybe with a meal or a blanket, or invite them to church. Think about what you can do to let them know they're not forgotten during this season of giving thanks. 
God bless you all and have a great Thanksgiving. Be sure to join us next time as we look into God's Word for our daily hope. This program is sponsored by Pastor Rick's Daily Hope and your generous financial support.